front of such an uh, illustrious group of people. A uh, very unusual audience for me, so uh, I will try to uh, break down some of those um, misconceptions, I want to say, that are out there uh, in the public. Uh, depicting livestock as one of the main environmental hazards of our life. Uh, so I was asked to talk about facts and fiction around livestock's uh, environmental footprint. And um, I will have a couple of slides that might be a little bit technical, uh, just talking about greenhouse gas, because a lot of the discussion that's out there right now is on the carbon footprint of livestock. I think everybody here has heard about livestock's carbon footprint and why we should replace animal source foods with more plant-based foods, um, plant-based burgers and so on, everybody has heard about them. Uh, then I will talk about something that uh, is also uh, often discussed, which is the so-called 2050 challenge, the drastic increase in human population. Um, and then, you know, just talk a little bit about efficiency and so on. I hope I, uh, I will not disappoint you. So, uh, just as I said, a few slides around what greenhouse gases are. Because everybody hears this term all the time, you hear about methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide and different gases that are so-called greenhouse gases. Well, what does that really mean? There are three of these main greenhouse gases, um, and what you see here is, I will just point it a little bit quickly, the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the earth. Normally that solar heat would be reflected back into space. If there weren't these so-called greenhouse gases, gases such as CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, these gases effectively form a carpet, like a carpet uh, trapping the heat from the sun in our low atmosphere. And the thicker that carpet becomes, the carpet of these greenhouse gases, the more heat is retained and the hotter it becomes. Okay? So here you see the three bad boys, CO2 on the left side, methane in the middle, and nitrous oxide on the right. These are three gas molecules. And when, imagine by fist being one of those molecules, when these gases are hit by a solar beam, they trap the heat from the sun and they retain that. The more of these gases you have in the atmosphere, the more heat trapping you get. And that had traditionally always been characterized by a simple number. And that number is referred to as the so-called global warming potential where people say methane is 28 times worse than CO2. And here's where most people stop. They say methane is worse than CO2. Ruminant livestock such as cattle, sheep, and goats produce that methane. And therefore, we have to limit the number of these animals because then we produce less methane. What those people who say that to the public do not represent is that there are other differences between these gases that are very important. For example, once you drive your car and you put CO2 in the atmosphere by burning gas, that CO2 that's in the atmosphere will have a lifespan of a thousand years. Any CO2 you've ever put into the atmosphere in your life is still there, still in the atmosphere. The only way for CO2 to go is upward, okay? There's no real process to reduce CO2 at least not at to the amounts or in the amounts that we are putting into our atmosphere. But here's where the big differences uh, lie between CO2, which is a long-lived climate pollutant with a thousand-year lifespan, versus methane, which only lives for 10 years. Once methane is put into the atmosphere, it lives for 10 years and 10 years only, and then it's destroyed. And that's obviously a big difference. Again, I will not give you here a biochem lecture or so, but I want to really point out one important difference between greenhouse gases from livestock versus greenhouse gases, let's say, from fossil fuel, oil, coal, and gas. On the livestock side, I take you back to your high school years, okay? Think back to photosynthesis. Think back to a plant. What does a plant need to grow? It needs CO2 from the air, and it needs sunlight from the sun. And once it has CO2 from the air and sunlight, these plants grow. Sooner or later, in livestock, agriculture, these plants will be eaten by, let's say, a cow in this picture. And inside this cow's stomach, that carbon-containing plant here will partly be changed into what's called methane. And that's what you see here coming out the front end of these animals. They are belching it out. That methane will be in the air for 10 years, will then be converted into CO2, and that same CO2 is then going back into plants, back into animals, back into the atmosphere. And it's a circle. 
It goes around and around and around. Again, methane is in the atmosphere for 10 years, and then it's no longer there. The amount of methane that's produced by livestock, the amount of methane that's produced in general in our world's atmosphere, is equal the amount of methane that's being destroyed. As long as we don't add new additional uh, uh, livestock to our livestock herds, we are not adding more methane, thus more warming to our atmosphere. That's a big difference compared to what you see on the right side here, which are fossil fuels, oil, coal, and gas at the bottom. They were stored in the ground for hundreds of millions of years as decayed plant material. And then that oil, coal, and gas was extracted. And what did we do to that carbon-containing stuff? We burned it. So where is that carbon now? It's in the atmosphere. And every time that it gets hit by the sun, these molecules heat up and trap it. This here, the fossil fuel side of this diagram on the right side, is very different from the left side. The left side is a circular and short-lived circle. On the right side, we have a one-way street from the bottom up into the top. So again, I will not talk about this anymore. Uh, but I wanted to point this out. So now you hear very often that livestock is one of the leading uh, causes of climate change and of greenhouse gases in general. Globally, that number is about 14.5%. That's all livestock in the world, 14.5%. But there are huge differences across different regions in the world with respect to how much greenhouse gases livestock emit. In the United States, for example, it's not 14.5%. And that number or a number similar to that should never be used here or in European countries because we have very different emissions from our livestock compared to, let's say, a country such as India or countries in Africa. And I will show you in a minute why. This here is a diagram from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States, and it shows different main sectors of emissions of greenhouse gases. On the left, you see a truck, and it says 28%. That means that transportation in the United States emits 28% of all greenhouse gases. Energy, so there's power production and use, another 28%. Industry, that's mainly the cement industry needed for producing concrete, 22%. So these first three industries combined make up 80%, 80 of all greenhouse gases in the United States. The same numbers hold true for most of Europe. All those fossil fuel consuming industries are responsible for approximately 80% of greenhouse gases in developed countries. You see then a cow here and a number 9%. That 9% are total greenhouse gas emissions from all of agriculture. Not just animal agriculture, all of agriculture. So that's animal and plant agriculture combined. According to the Environmental Protection Agency and this emission inventory, which is the latest one, Animal agriculture in the United States contributes to 3.9%. Let's call that 4%. That's all beef, all dairy, all sheep and goats and, 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 and poultry and so on, 3.9%. That is a number that you should remember because oftentimes we are confronted with the assertion that livestock produces more greenhouse gases than all cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships in the world combined. And this is nothing but misleading and, in my opinion, very dangerous. Because what it suggests is that all we need to do is watch what we eat, because that, they say, is the main culprit of our carbon emissions, and then everything else we do can be relaxed upon. And that is not the case. There are many activities you are involved in, for example, flying here, that are way more environmentally impactful than what you eat. That's not for me to say that what you eat doesn't matter, but on a scale, it is dwarfed by other activities we all engage in. So this is the Environmental Protection Agency official emission inventory. This is just another depiction of the same thing, the EPA emission inventory. What you see on the x-axis are the years 1990 to 2017. On the y-axis you see total greenhouse gases. And the only reason why I want to show this is because this green area, uh, area down there, that's the total contribution of all of agriculture, not just animal agriculture, mm. all of agriculture. It just shows to you how important agriculture is compared to everything else we do. Okay? Agriculture clearly has contributions, but of course we need to eat. And every time you produce food, we will have environmental footprint. However, that footprint is dwarfed by other things we do. And 
you will see that in a minute. Now think of all the greenhouse gases cause, causing climate change in the world combined. Everything in the world combined is 49. The number is 49 gigatons okay, in the world, all greenhouse gases. Of that, the United States is responsible for 12% of all global greenhouse gases, 12%. And this slide here shows what I'm saying. These are all greenhouse gases that the total five. And then this piece here in blue, uh, purple, and gray, that's the total greenhouse gases associated with the United States. In blue, you see the portion of US greenhouse gases that's fossil fuel related. Fossil fuel is 11 of the 12% of US contribution. And then you see those tiny ones here. The purple one is animal agriculture, and the gray one is plant agriculture of everything that's produced and consumed in the United States with respect to food, that contributes to 1.1% of total global greenhouse gases. I'll give you one more number. I'm originally from Germany. Germany as a country makes up 2% of all global greenhouse gases. 2% of the total of all global greenhouse gases. If the whole of Germany would stop eating meat today, it would be 0.05% percent of total global greenhouse gases, which is not measurable. We could never measure, that's what I do for a living. I measure gases, believe it or not, that's, my, that's what I do. <laughs> we could not measure that ever. Okay? So that's not for me to say we should not worry about what we eat and where and so on. We should, but I just want to put it into perspective. Fossil fuel use by far is the main, the main culprit of climate emissions. This slide here is a very important one. It brings those 300 undergraduate students I teach at, at UC Davis to the fronts of their seats. It is the so-called 2050 challenge. What it shows on the x-axis are the years 1750 to 2050, hence the name 2050 challenge. And on the z-axis you see total human population in billion. I just turned 50. When I was a little boy, we were right here at 3 billion people. Today we are at 7.6 billion people. And by the time I'm an old man, we will be at 9.5 billion people. In other words, throughout my lifetime and yours, human population on this planet will have tripled. We will have three times more people on this planet during our lifetimes. And this is the challenge of our lifetimes. Because how do we feed three times more people on this planet without depleting all natural resources we have? That's the question. When you ask people in the place where I live, in Davis, California, how we should do that, they say we should go back to the 1950 dairy and beef operation and poultry. They think a poultry operation with more than 200 chickens is not sustainable. They think if you have a dairy with more than 50 cows, you are a mega dairy. I have news for them. The efficiencies that we have learned to develop in animal agriculture are not different from those that were just presented to you by my, uh, by, by my uh, uh, fellow speaker. Efficiencies in food production have no alternatives to them. Because otherwise, we will deplete all natural resources on this planet with lightning speed. What you see on this graph, too, is two different colors. You see this, uh, whatever this color is, this orange here. That's human population in developed countries, such as North America and Europe. And then you see this other color here, and that's human population increase in developing countries. As you can see, human population is going skyrocket high. Not so much because everybody's having 10 babies, but because of increasing life expectancies. Throughout the world, people are getting older, and we all want to live a long life, but cumulatively that means that we have more mouths to feed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the 2050 challenge. And the question in front of me and my colleagues is, how do we satisfy that challenge? This year, I think, is a very important slide. It shows the world and the circle over Southeast Asia. This circle over Southeast Asia contains more people in it than the rest of the world combined. More people live inside than outside this circle. Every 10 years, the population of the United States is added to that circle. So clearly one of the food security areas of the world. But even though it's a significant one, it's not the number one. The number one is depicted here. You can see Southeast Asia will increase by 41%, South and Southeast Asia. Africa will increase by almost 50%. South America by seven, North America by four, Europe will slightly shrink. The 2050 challenge is real, but it is not a challenge that's equally important throughout the world.
It is a main challenge in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. This slide here from a German news uh, magazine shows it nicely. You can see China will slightly shrink by 3%, Bangladesh and India will each increase by a quarter. And now look at these African countries. They will increase by at least 100%, meaning their populations will double every 10 years. Double every 10 years. That, ladies and gentlemen, is where the 2050 challenge will play out. And we must assist them to overcome the challenges they have. Because if we don't, they will be very unhappy and they will start marching to wherever they need to go to make a living for their families. And if you don't believe me, just look back three years ago and see what happened in Germany. Just two years ago, a million people stood into that one country in one year. And these were people pretty much fleeing from food insecurity and conflict related to that and so on. It's a very important question. Whether we have 3, 7, 9 or 12 billion people in the world, this year, ladies and gentlemen, is the only land we have to grow crops to feed these people. I will now show you one of my favorite depictions of the challenge. This year is a normal sheet of paper. Imagine this to be the size of the surface of the earth, okay? I will now fold this piece of paper and I will fold it twice. And what you see now is the total amount of land, because the rest is water and ice. This is all land in the world, the rest is water and ice. This is my business card, and the equipment area of my business card in the world is all agricultural land. So this here is all land, and this is all agricultural land to grow food for people. You can see it's not very much. The rest is deserts and jungles and cities and so on. This is all agricultural land. Now I take my business card and I fold it into one piece that's two-thirds its original size, and the other piece one-third, and then I rip my own business card into pieces. Remember, this is all agricultural land. The larger of the two pieces is what we call marginal land. This is land that's used for agricultural purposes, but the soil is not good enough or there's not enough water to grow crops. What do you think we do with that land currently? Anybody? We use it for grazing ruminant livestock, such as cattle, sheep, and goats. They're the only ones that can make use of that land. Why? Because they have a stomach system that allows them to digest cellulose. Nobody else can digest that but ruminant animals. 70% of all agricultural land used today in the world is used with ruminant livestock and cannot be used with anything else. Those people who say we should divorce ourselves from animal agriculture, get rid of it altogether, would effectively advocate that we will not make use of 70% of all agricultural land, the so-called marginal land. Unthinkable, unthinkable in my mind. Because the only other land used for that land would be golf courses or something else, but nothing food related. The remainder of my business card, this one third, is the total amount of agricultural land in the world that's referred to as arable. Here you can grow crops. For humans or for animals. This is how limited we are. This is how limited we are. So the 2050 challenge is real and we are resource limited, and we must make use of all resources known to man in order to satisfy our, not just nutritional, but resource uh, uh, demands. What you see on this side are greenhouse gases in the developing countries on the left side, related to livestock, and developed uh, countries on the right side. And what you can see on the right side is that greenhouse gases are plateauing. So they're not increasing anymore, even though we're producing more and more livestock products, we are not increasing emissions. On the left side, you see that greenhouse gases associated with livestock are going up. Why? Because more and more people demand animal source foods, and in order to satisfy that demand, more and more livestock is produced. This slide is a very important one. I know I take you far out here with respect to your area of expertise, but on the x-axis here you see total amount of milk produced per cow per year. Milk produced per cow per year. On the left side, you see low producing cows, on the right side, high producing cows. And the y axis shows the carbon footprint, the, the greenhouse gas footprint, pretty much. What you see here on the left side is that cows that produce very little milk, 
have a very high carbon footprint. This is the equivalent of you running in your car, you're turning it on on your driveway, but you're not driving it. You just run it all week, and then you drive it once to a supermarket, and then you come back and you keep it running. Not very efficient use of a car. This is what we call idle livestock, because these animals are fed food and so on, but they are not producing much product. So you can see here on the left side, cows produce about a thousand or so pounds per mil of, of milk per cow per year. And on the right side, we see very high producing cows. For example, here in the United States, the average cow produces 23,000 pounds of milk. 23,000 pounds of milk per year. In India, it's 1,000 pounds. You need 23 times the number of cows in India to produce the same as one cow here. Five times more in Mexico than one cow here. I'm not talking badly about certain countries, and I don't want to single out anyone. What I'm telling you is, there are massive differences in efficiencies. And we can and must overcome these differences, because we are that resource limited. We must help those countries in the world that currently don't have a veterinary system, don't have proper genetics, don't have proper feeding, to overcome their challenges. This is an ethical must. This is not a pet. It's a must. This slide here shows different regions in the world on the x-axis and the carbon footprint on the y-axis. And you can see that the same areas that are depicted as the major challenges for the 2050 challenge also are the ones with the highest carbon footprint per milk production, which is depicted here. So West Asia and Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and so on, have the highest carbon footprint, not just for milk production, also of beef, poultry, and so on. The same areas that need it the most have the most inefficient production of food, of, um, of food at this point. How did we get to where we are? In the United States, let's say, and in many European countries, we have learned to use four main tools. We have improved reproduction of those animals. We have improved health care, so preventing disease and treating them. We have improved the genetics of plants and animals. And we have learned to feed more energy-dense diets. These four tools have allowed us to shrink the number of animals that we need to satisfy societal demands to historic lows. Never have we had fewer livestock and poultry than we do today to satisfy the nutritional needs of our societies. And I know the public perception is the opposite. The public thinks we've never had greater, larger herds and flocks, but that's inaccurate. I'll give you two examples, really quickly. Back in 1950, we used to have 25 million dairy cows in the United States. 25. Today, we have 9 million dairy cows. So we have cut our herd from 25 to 9 million, but we are producing 60% more milk with this much smaller herd. We went from 25 to 9, but we are producing 60% more milk. That means the carbon footprint of a gallon of milk has shrunk by two-thirds. The same is true for beef. Here you see how many animals were slaughtered over the years from 1970 until pretty much today. How many animals were slaughtered? You can see total slaughter numbers are pretty drastically down. But the amount of beef produced is going up at the same time. Okay, the slaughter numbers go down and production levels are going up. Many people say, well, we are eating way too much red meat, we are eating way too much beef. What this slide shows, I think very nicely, on the left, on the y, on the x-axis, are the years 1909 to 2015, and on the y-axis you see total amount of, of meat eating per person. What you see is that over the last 100 years, beef consumption in the United States has stayed stable. We are, produced, we are eating 0.6% more beef. We are eating 3% less total red meat, but in total we are still eating way more meat. But what it is that we are eating is poultry. 500% more chicken over the last 100 plus years. That's what we are increasing. Not beef, not pork, 500% more chicken. That's where it's going. And then last but not least, just one slide. There are many people who say we are eating way too much meat. Everybody hears this all the time. This is like a mantra that everybody seems to agree upon. I will now show you the actual data that the dietary guidelines of the US are suggesting we should eat 
versus what we actually do eat. Okay? What we should eat versus what we actually do eat. On this slide here you see that in 1960, the USDA estimated that we actually eat 5.8 ounces of meat. The dietary guideline says we should eat 5.5 ounces. So we should eat 5.8, we do eat 5.5, so approximately the same. But now see those two graphs here. On the left side you see males of different age groups, from little babies to old people. On the left side, males first, and then females following. The blue bars show the recommended range of what we eat with respect to protein. Okay? So we should eat from here to here, that's the range we should eat. And the dots show what we actually do eat. Now compare what we should eat versus what we do eat. And then you tell me where we are drastically overeating protein. To me, that seems like there are three age groups in one gender that are overeating protein. And that is middle-aged men. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. But you're the only ones who slightly overeat protein. Everybody else is not overeating protein, particularly not women. You can see most women are uh, eating, consuming protein at the lower recommended re uh, uh, levels. So it is not true that we are drastically overeating protein in this country. I know it's a mantra, I know the media talks about it all the time, but it does not conform with the actual data. By the way, the data here is from the NHAMES uh, study, which is pretty much the two-go study of any kind of nutritional scientist and dietitian that I know of. So with that, uh, I want to show this one slide to you and then I'm pretty much done. It shows on the x-axis the years 1948 and 2015. It shows farm inputs, so all the inputs that go into a farm being pretty stable from 1948 until today. But agricultural productivity, the amount of food produced, is going skyrocket high. We are going one way and one way only in how we produce food and that is going up at a very a very steep rate. And this, ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not, is the only way we can satisfy the 2050 challenge. There's no other. I mean, we can either shrink human population, and you tell me how we do that, or we find ways of improving productivity. And that's what we have done. This is my last slide. People ask me, can we eat our way out of climate change? So, if we were to assume that you are an omnivore, you eat everything today, and you now decide to go vegan for one year, for one year, in order to improve your environmental performance, then that move will, would reduce your carbon footprint by 0.8 tons of greenhouse gas footprint. 0.8 tons. One year of going vegan. If you fly from here in New York to Frankfurt, Germany, one flight, then that equates to 1.6 tons of CO2 equivalent. Meaning one flight from here to Europe equates to twice the amount of carbon uh, emissions than going vegan for one year. If the United States in total would go vegan as Monday, we would reduce the carbon footprint of our country by 0.3%. And if the entire country, 320 million Americans, would go vegan, we would reduce the carbon footprint of the United States by 2.6%. That to me is a pretty clear indication that we cannot keep our way, our way out of climate change. We have to be clear as to what the main challenges are. We have to play our role, and we have done so in agriculture. And we will continue to do so. And your industry is actually a very important industry to play into the overall environmental performance of livestock. Because livestock is not just about meat and milk and eggs. It is also about, in the case of a beef steer, let's say, 400 total commodities. And one that's very important is euros, the leather commodity. So with that, I come to a close here, and I want to thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to any questions I might get. Thank you.